good Saturday morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're at. I have to say it's been a long week, but very productive for me and getting shows set up for December. Ooh. And of course, I've been watching a bunch of stuff and there's a bunch of movies coming out. Mm-hmm. And I think I saw Puss in Boots is coming out, another one. A man named Otto, which had Tom Hanks in it, which was from the producers or writers of Grumpy Old Men. And there was another one that just talked about Willows coming out the end of the month. So there is a ton coming out. But I want to say welcome to the show. We have John Stocker here with us today, and he's done quite a bit of stuff. And one of the first questions that I do want to ask is, <clears throat> is it true about John Candy and how he was on set and how nice he was? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it's um, it's difficult to, uh, sometimes to describe. I, I get asked about Johnny a lot of times. And we, we had a couple of years where we were you know, virtually inseparable. You wanted to find him, you looked for me. You know, wanted to find me, you looked for him. Mm-hmm. And it was... Um, couple of the best years of my 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 life and he was one of my closest friends at that time um and he was just one of those heart on your sleeve kind of guys and you you gotta you those people kind of uh are, are, give love and are receptive to it and um it was a really fabulous fabulous relationship despite the fact that we did uh, a lot of very naughty things. <laughs> uh, but, you know, hey, it was that era, that time. But, yeah, he was, uh, he was truly, uh, he was so giving. That's one of the things that, you know, they talk about him being a, a nice guy and everything, but, boy, oh, boy, he was so selfless, really. Um, it was, um, it was a, a, a wonderful relationship, and I... Uh, remember it fondly and will go to my grave remembering it as a good, such a wonderful section of my life. Awesome. I think moment of silence there. (laughs) Well, there's been a lot of actors that have gone that have gone too early. Yeah. Definitely Mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah. Well, you know, John, I mean, he was too heavy. Mm -hmm. Uh, He drank too much. He smoked too much. He was like, he just, he lived it absolutely to the max. Still 43 is too young, no matter what. I mean, that's, you know. But he was carrying, I, I, I really honestly think that the weight and uh, and just the intensity uh, that he lived uh, were, were just overwhelming. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So, outside of John, who was the favorite actor so far that you've worked with? Oh, favorite? Oh, gosh. If I mentioned some of them, you, you would right, go. Top five, top ten. Well, <laughs> I don't know. You know they're not, well, I, I have to right now. <laughs> A lot of them are going to be voice actors. And, of course, I'm a Canadian, and I work uh, in 99. Mm-hmm. I work is out of Canada, so you wouldn't know. Um, there was an actor that I, I just loved working with named Chris Wiggins. And it, this goes way back to the days of the when Care Bears was first produced, and Chris was the voice of No Heart, uh, and he was a British actor who uh, transplanted to Toronto, and I, I, I just loved being with him and around him, and you know he would come in and we we were waiting. Of course, we, it was a non digital age; we were all in the studio. Mm-hmm. Or in the waiting room or at an audition so the uh, you know a lot of that is has gone by the by the wayside now because we're we're digital and you you don't uh, you don't see people quite as much but i remember always joking we'd, we'd be some you we wouldn't i was younger and he was older and we wouldn't always be auditioning for the same uh, same role so i'm I, he would always joke about his teeth coming out he had false teeth he would sometimes take them out just to I think just to freak people out, and uh, and I'm you know I always said well you're auditioning for so and so is this uh just teeth in or teeth out audition Chris right <laughs> <laughs> so we always had that uh, that joke going and he was just a joy to work with and uh, 
He's done some wonderful on camera work too. Uh, just a just a, a good guy and and, and good work. Um, another um, my, my best friend right now is a and has been for many many years. Is a, his name is Neil Crone. Um, I don't know if you got a series uh, in the states called Little Mosque on the Prairie. Uh, it's done in uh, it was done in Canada, and, uh, and he played a, he played a, a, a radio guy who was a real bigot. So totally opposite to what he really is. And Neil's a, Neil's a, just a fine human being, and I love him. He's if I had a brother, I don't. Uh, I would pick him if I had to have to choose a brother. Uh, but then I probably couldn't say the things to him that I say. So maybe not. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just stay friends. I think that's a lot safer. <laughs> that you might end up in a fist fight. Oh, God, you know. <laughs> you, know it's, you know, Dad always liked you more. <laughs> uh, let me just stop at those two for now. Let's, uh, I, I, you know. Well, uh, you worked like a bunch of series. Did you have oh, like people, like... What's one of your favorite live ones, and what's one of your favorite voice ones? Well, okay, they're they're all um, older uh, productions. <laughs> I love what I'm doing today, but mm -hmm. I say they're my favorites. I'm actually, it's funny. I'm I'm working on a on a series right now. Here we are, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm it's an animated series, an adult uh, animated series called Red Ketchup. Oh uh, my! Uh oh, you know Red Ketchup? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. That name. Uh, it's uh, a. <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, Written by two of uh, the, the original is a comic book mm -hmm. uh, from uh, two French Canadian guys um, who uh, and it was written in the early 80s. And this is the series based on it. Um, and the uh, the production people are fabulous. Um, Oasis animation and um, the head, uh, the right the head of the writers uh, is a guy named Will Wenickers. Um, I worked with him on, uh, did you get a series called Forget About It? It was an animated uh, adult an a animation. No, no. Look it up. Forget About It's Why does the, that premise, the premise is just, the, the premise is funny. It's mm -hmm. about a, a mob guy in New Jersey who kills the dawn. He pushes him out a window and he kills him. So he's put in the witness protection program because they, you know, everybody's going after him, blah, blah, blah. So they put him in Saskatchewan. And he talks like this all the time, right? Yeah, I was born in Saskatchewan. What do you mean? Right? And so <laughs> if you know Saskatchewan, it's a Western Canadian province. The last thing you're going to get there is somebody, I mean, they won't even probably even think of living there, is, is a, is a mob, an ex-mobster from New Jersey. So the premise was really, really brilliant. Being in the witness protection for this whole family and his uh, his uh, his uncle and it was a and I got to voice direct that for him and uh, and that was a and Will's a brilliant a brilliant guy uh, so I am this is this I'm, I'm loving this a lot uh, but I've got to say if I had to pick sort of a character out of a series uh, it, it would still be Beastly from Care Bears uh, mm -hmm. the whole vibe of it. Uh, I know we talked before the cameras rolled here that uh, I, I love things that are just purely entertainment. And mm -hmm. this was the early days of animation. We still called them cartoons at that point. Uh, and uh, and they, it, it was just simple. Good versus bad. Mm -hmm. Good wins. Oh, boy. <laughs> it was yeah. as simple as that, and it was, but it was entertaining. And look at how long that series has been going. They've made, they've remade it, but the original series still runs. I know because I get resids. So uh, you know, and 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 I think that's a really good thing. So that was my favorite. My, I would say my favorite series still would have would be um, Care Bears, but I've done a bunch of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Red Wall, or was a, I did. I like Red Wall. Well, the third season of Red Wall, I played a character called Tamun Klog, mm -hmm. and uh, who was the, and I had to come up with the voice. It was funny, and I loved doing it, but every time I went in, the engineer would say, Do you want a reference? I don't know if you know that when, you, when you're doing something, when you do a series, a voice series, they always keep a, a line that will click you into, Oh, oh that's the voice. Mm -hmm. Most performers love that reference. You know, like I say, I know when I direct, I always like take the line that really emulates 
the characters, everything in mm-hmm. two lines, right? And um, I always had to hear it and then work through it to get this voice back. It was just so bizarre. So, so many of them have different things that hooked me in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I mean, I love the voice game, so I try to find something. So what new. was it that hooked you in? What was the lines? Oh, no, I don't remember what that was. The, oh. you no, know, I, I have absolutely no idea what that was, but it was just the voice itself was just this weird thing that mm-hmm. the, um, the the voice director, Ray Jaffelis from Nelvana, um, we worked on it for, oh, my God, we almost worked a half hour just to find the voice. Oh, wow. Right, yeah, and it was a, a bit of a throat ripper. Uh, but it was, uh, but it, it was so unusual. I, I'd never be able to use it again mm-hmm. without being, if anybody that knew, would, would be recognized. Mm-hmm. But again, my favorite being Care Bears. So that was, uh, again, I was asked, "What do you?" Uh, these are in the days too when they would just call me in, say, mm-hmm. "Okay, son, you're doing this role." Okay, yeah, it's a series. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, and you're going to be in every episode. Okay, good. Um, Sure. Here's the picture. What do you got? Right? And you'd work with someone who just recognized perhaps a performance standard that he wanted. Mm-hmm. Heard my head, my voice in his head, knew me, knew I could they could work with me, of course, and, and but knew I would come up with something. And so it, it's it's you become more attached to the series when you're actually a part of the, the real creative, not script the not dictated necessarily by the script by the voice, which also uh, is part of the character uh, development, right? Certain yeah. voice does make you recall certain things. So so there's that. On camera, I still must go back to the days when I did work with uh, with John Candy. It was a series called Coming Up Rosie. And uh, wow, what a cast that was. Uh, that was out of Toronto. It was John Candy, Gilda Radner, uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, mm-hmm. Our guests, oh, wow. were, yeah, Marty Short was on it. Uh, um, uh, Dave Thomas, um, um, mm-hmm. uh, just I mean, just fabulous, fabulous. Joe Flaherty uh, from uh, these guys for love and from SCTV. Uh, and, I mean, it was a star-studded cast, uh, and me, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And, and it was it was fun because it was just every damn day in the, uh, in the on the set was fun. The, the the director would say, "Okay, have you all read the script? Yeah, okay, throw it away, right?" And I'd be in, you know, we we and Ackroyd was just freaking brilliant. He's with his with his improv sense. All of them were. Gilda was just mind blowing too, right? And we would just improvise on this stuff. We'd get, we'd get the um, sort of the nugget of the intention of the scene. Mm-hmm. We knew where we had to start, knew where we had to finish. But all the stuff in the middle, I mean, after doing it two or three times, some of the lines were, were down pat. But sometimes the responses were different. And we would have trouble. We would laugh. And it would be, OK, cat. <laughs> but it was what a wonderful experience building, helping to build the show. I was going to say, with a cast like that, I mean, how oh. would you get anything done? Because oh, everybody no. would be Oh, we were, you know, <laughs> it was brilliant. I, I mean, Dan Aykroyd went through the ceiling of a, we were, we had one scene that was on the ceiling, uh, on the ceiling, on the the roof of the studio. <laughs> well, the director was nuts. I love him. <laughs> Trevor Evans lives in, uh, lives in British Columbia now. And uh, uh, yeah, and Dan went through a skyline. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> right down. Actually, had to they had to go to the hospital. It was, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It wasn't that funny, uh, but uh, <laughs> but it wasn't. It, it, it you know he was fine, right? But uh, you know, but it was just nuts. It was that was sort of the the the, the ultimate uh, <laughs> sort of result would be stupid things like that. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, in retrospect, it's very funny. Yeah, it's true. At the time, we almost, you know, we almost all had coronaries. <laughs> oh, wow. So I'm, I'm curious. Can we ask you about your work on um, one of my favorite cartoon series back in the day, Deke Entertainment, because you worked on um, Super Mario Brothers. I did, oh. I did. You know, we, uh, 
it was funny. Uh, I don't know if you know this. You know what they what they said Deke stood for? Do it. Oh, whatever you probably can't say here. Do it cheap. Oh, okay. Do it cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's that's how that was uh, the in joke. Well, Super Mario was great too. I, I worked with some mm -hmm. some just brilliant guys. Here's another actor, old time actor that uh, uh, Danny Wells. I worked with Danny Wells, who uh, was Luigi, and he was Luigi both in the uh, the animated portion and uh, in the on camera when he worked with uh, Lou Albano, uh, and uh, but in the animation, um, uh, Walker Boone played um, Mario, and uh, Lou Albano was still a live action Mario, but Danny played Luigi in both, and uh, Danny was just a what a great guy, great to, I got to his last, I think this was his last production. He, there was a, uh, a, a Disney thing that I directed called Ella the Elephant, and it lasted one season. It was cute and sweet, probably too sweet and cute. But um, <laughs> Danny played the mayor, and uh, remember at the end, he said, yeah, um, he, he did a lot. Danny, by the way, uh, any actor you mentioned or actress that you mentioned, he'd say, oh, yeah, I worked with him. Oh, I worked with him. Do you want to hear a story? He was one of those guys. He was. It was captivating because you, there was nobody you could mention that he didn't have a little story about. It was unbelievable. Wow. So it was so interesting. And to and he, and Danny worked on. It was the, it was the mayor and Ella the elephant. And uh, he said, "Yeah, I'm going to go down and visit my uh, sons. They they were. He was in, he lived in California, and I. Well, he never came back. He had actually was not going to California. He was going to the hospital. Just didn't want anybody to know. And. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he had cancer and he died, and uh, yeah, it was too bad. But uh, Danny was a was just a sweetheart, just a sweetheart. And that was one of the wonderful things about doing Super Mario was working with those people. It was a great studio too. I remember uh, this is uh, early '90s, so I hate to tell you how long ago. No, it was early '90s, '92, '92. Uh, so it's four years ago, I guess, right? Um, and um, yeah, uh, we went to a, the, the, where the studio was was way out at that point in the boonies. Now it's practically downtown Toronto, but and it was called Master's Workshop, and they did religious uh, music production there. So the studio was just fabulous, just as big where they could get musicians. It was one of those old time uh, studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a great experience uh, environmentally to work as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you voiced um, Toad in every episode, every series? Uh, of the, well, the, two, the two original, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Yes, I was Toad in, in, in all of those. Mm -hmm. um, when Toad uh, became a Nintendo hit, I was not part of that. Um, it's just those first two. First oh, he doesn't even talk anymore. He just goes, yeah. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> there have been, I think, five toads at this point. Yeah. But there's only one original. Yes. You know, what can I say? <laughs> yes, I watch it on Pluto TV, so I get to hear you all the time. Yeah. <laughs> now, one thing. You also have different Deke series that I love, a lot of girls love, a lot of boys love. Sailor Moon, you are the director. I was the voice Original. director, and I was uh, one of the two people that played Grandpa Hino as well. And, awesome. Uh, yeah. I got to play a pervert. <laughs> you need a little of that in your life. Everybody <laughs> does. Uh, but yes, I was. There were three uh, three voice directors of Sailor Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one um, was the, the original Sailor Moon. Um, oh, God. You wouldn't know. I forget. God. Get a, a, a mind... Brain fart, brain fart. Uh, Why can't I remember her name? Oh, God, this is really embarrassing. She'll probably text me later or email me later and say, what are you, you, you forgot? Anyway, she was the original Sailor Moon. She did the first 12 or 14 episodes. She was the voice of Sailor Moon, and then she was, um, she was the voice director as well. And then Roland Parliament took over as the voice director after that, when they swapped Sailor Moons out. And then I came in for part of the uh, that middle Sailor Moon and uh, did the Linda Ballantyne years, the S series, R series. But yeah, I've done, I've voice directed more 
if you will. I call myself the principal voice director because I did more than anybody else. Oh, I'm awesome. speaking to that. That is awesome. So I have who directed the first season. Is that the one you're talking about? So me on the first season? Is that what you're talking about, the director? Yeah. Tracy okay. Moore. Tracy yeah. Moore. There you go. Yeah, Tracy Moore. <laughs> I got it before you told me. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to bail you out. I yeah, was thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it was just actually the yeah, fact that I was going to be really embarrassed that made my mind suddenly spew it out. I did not want you to get that nasty phone call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's been great. Tracy's, uh, Tracy uh, had me out too. She's in Victoria, BC, British Columbia, just across on Victoria Island uh, uh, near Vancouver. Ooh. She had me out for a for a seminar a couple of years ago. It was nice. Nice. Um, did you work on any other D cartoons? Like, I know Inspector Gadget was was a big hit, but yeah. I, for me, Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, I did one episode. I was doing. Uh, it's funny. I did it. I, I did a movie called "Look Who's Talking Now." Oh. Uh, and, uh, and I've got like a small part in it. You hear my voice. I'm the guy that has the puppies. Uh, that they when they pick the puppy. And uh, so I've got a few things and it was wonderful. They flew me out first class out of Toronto. It was wonderful. They flew me out. And uh, when, when I was going out there, my agent contacted, my agent at the time contacted a lot of the animation houses and, and said, um, John Stalker's coming out. Uh, would you like to use him? Of course, there was, again, it wasn't digital era. So my being there was a boon for a lot of them. So that's when I did, uh, whatever, I don't even remember how many episodes, and I think it was no more than two that I did uh, for Sonic. So I was a small time player in, in that, really. But I did a bunch of things out there, and that was, they were all Deke productions, I think. Deke was big. Deke was, uh, was, was, uh, was a dominant uh, a player. Well, it's the same. I think it became Cookie Jar. Someone told me it's now renamed Wild Brain. Is that uh, Wild Brain. Yes. Cause... Well, it's, it's yeah. They're just they're incarn incarnations. I mean, um, uh, Michael Hirsch mm -hmm. was one of the founders of Nelvana. Michael Hirsch, Clive Smith, and Patrick Lubert were the original principals of mm -hmm. Nelvana. Uh, and when Nelvana was sold, Michael started Cookie Jar, and then mm -hmm. he sold, and then he sold Cookie Jar. He bought. I think he bought the 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 Sinar Library Center, which was uh, out of uh, out of Montreal. I think he, if I'm not incorrect, uh, he bought them as well, uh, and um, and then he sold. Uh, and Wild Brain was I don't know if they're a direct offshoot or if they simply purchased Cookie Jar. Um, the huge library. I think a lot of a lot of a lot of production now is, is is they do some production, but a lot of the 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 monetary value in a company is its library, so that they can they can they can disperse and uh, disseminate a lot of the cartoon series. Yeah, I'm actually pretty happy because like on YouTube, when you look at Wild Brain, it lists all the old Sonic cartoons from Deep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <gasps> means Deke got Sonic back, and I'm so happy because the new Sonic voice actor. It's not Jewel White. I love Jewel White. I wish he would come back, but he can't do that voice anymore. But it's yeah. a new And you're like, oh, I'm just so happy he got it back. Yeah, you know? getting as you get older, the voices become... Uh, so I was like, I, I can barely do Toad now without like giving myself a double hernia. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, it, it's tough. I mean, the, you know, the chords, as you get older, your chords get stretched. Yes. And it was falsetto. And, um, you know, it's... it's um, it's tough. It's kind tough like to, to do those youthful Optimus Prime voices. Pardon? Peter Colin, the original Optimus Prime. Yeah. He doesn't do it that much anymore. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a tough one. That's a throw. It's one of those. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my Ultron voice. Right? Uh, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're tough ones. But, uh, and, uh, I always I have this theory about w one of the reasons why older actors don't do a, 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 as much work. It's, one is because they they're I think they're afraid they're going to have a, a coronary in the studio or something or have to run out in the middle and change the colostomy bag or something. I don't know, but uh, but uh, but it's also because you, it, it's tougher to double um, an older character. I mean, when I was young, I could do old voices. 
But when you're old, it's very difficult to do younger voices. And so your uh, versatility, the versatility factor is somewhat diminished. Mm. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Now, I'm one that likes to be more behind the scenes type stuff. And you were talking 90s and you're now doing stuff present day. Yeah. What do you miss from the studios from the old days that you wish that they had now? Uh -huh. I can tell you in one word, camaraderie. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's an it's, it's, it's a communication business, right, that we're in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and part of it is, I think, in order to be a very honest communicator to the public with a voice that you're, I mean, we give a heart and soul. If you're really into it, you give a heart, give your heart and your soul into a character. You really, mm -hmm. you know, you, it may be from a corner of you somewhere. It may, you know, it's not the in, entire persona, but um, so if you communicate, you, you've got to, you've got to be a communicator. And if you're not a communicator in real life, man, you've got to be one hell of an actor because some of it, you hear a role and you go, oh, man, that's really good. That's because there's something in that person that comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really feel that. So it's like a, in, a, in a communication industry, communication in all aspects of your life is important. And the, the friendships and even if we weren't buddy buddies, mm -hmm. uh, in the, in, like when I talked about Chris Wiggins or, uh, um, you know, and um, with Neil, my, my friend, we met in the studio. We met and, and became became buddies. And so many of the people that I've had wonderful relationships are people I've met because we struck up conversation and had uh, mutual loves, mu mutual dislikes, mutual opinions. Um, and and that's, that's really important. And now, um, not only is it is it uh, is, is so much of it patched in mm -hmm. you do it from home if you go to studio although they still they're again post covid they like when you come in i i don't know if that's you know i don't know do i, I mean, and i do enjoy it i do enjoy the physicality of a studio uh and i find it helps me but but also everything now is done individually there's very very little ensemble work and for a good reason it, it costs too much money you've got five people in a cast you got to pay all five of them for a day because it takes that long to to do uh, a two hundred and whatever it is. Most scripts are about uh, twenty two minutes is about two hundred and this is about two hundred and forty lines, uh, two hundred and forty cues rather. And so it takes that long. So you got to pay everybody for the full day. If you just bring everybody in singly, you got them for an hour. You got them for two hours. You're paying everybody uh, like the four hour because it's most calls union wise is a four hour max. Anything over that you pay overtime or you start or you double or close to double for the remaining four hours. And so you got somebody in for an hour, the next one for two hours, one for a half hour, one for three, right? You're paying them all within the minimum scope of the, of the, of the, uh, of the union agreement. So it's a lot less expensive. But don't you guys like play off of each other somehow? Well, no. I mean, the problem is when you start playing off uh, against your your fellow performers, the tendency sometimes is to be a little bit. Uh, to, to, well, it's it, it it gets into the theater mode, and you tend to overlap. Well, you want overlap with voices. You gotta t you gotta do it again. You can't overlap. All the lines have to be clear. That's why uh, when there's a dash, when you know. But I want to. Right. Well, you know the you, you, it shows you're being cut off. Mm -hmm. so you've got to be adept at uh, uh, giving the illusion of being cut off. It's, it's a vocal, um, simply, a, it's not a trick, but it's just a vocal um, uh, talent, if you will. I don't know what you want to call it, but you know, have to know how to do it, right? Some And some mm -hmm. people don't, right? Some people don't know how to cut themselves off. I'll tell you uh, what you do is, as a director, I always say, never cut off on a consonant. You cut off on a vowel. Mm -hmm. I want to go, right? And it's easy. You try to cut yourself off on a on a consonant, it doesn't work. So, which one do you do you more prefer, the group lines or the single? It depends. As a performer, I I like 
both of them, I think, and for their, um, you know, for, for their, their individual values. As a director, I just love the individual recording. You've got to remember, too, that a lot of performers need someone as a almost a reader. Mm -hmm. uh, a skilled performer, skilled voice performers don't really need anybody. Um, that's why when you do animation, you, you read the whole script. Mm -hmm. um, you, you read everything. You know that there's a line before yours is a handoff. It's like in, in football, right? You know? The, you know the the quarterback hands it off to the to the fullback coming up behind him right or you know you, you and your line has got to lead into the line following so you have to know and that that's why I mean being a director you, you've got to know every line I, I like that more it forces you to get a handle on the entire script mm -hmm. and I mean again when I direct I uh, I, I get really pissed off when people come in. It's very old school. Where's mm -hmm. the script? Um, I I don't have one. Well, how did you how did you work on it? Well, I I used um, I just read it uh, off the screen. I said, well, don't you make notes? Well, no. <laughs> See, and I'm a I'm a firm believer that and I because I teach as well. You you get mm -hmm. you get out a pencil, never a pen, because as soon as you do something with a pen, uh, they'll want to recorrect, but pencil and make your little notes, a little D, a little thing, a little squiggle, a little something that, that lets you know, because when you're reading through, you don't have time to read the other line, the line before, the line after, but you have to know what it is as you, as you scan down the page and read your script, right? But your little squiggle says, oh, that's, I'm, I'm excited, I'm angry, I'm this, I'm that, mm -hmm. right? So that it, it's a little trigger to say, oh yeah, this is the line where I'm doing this. Right now, I think it's very, very important. It's very old school, but mm -hmm. more and more people now, I find more directors um, say, you bring your own script, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll and i say, if you don't have it, I'll tell you what, I'll print it and deliver it, right? Just so you come in with, I want to see all kinds of marks and want to see your lines highlighted, you know. Yeah. Mm, right? It's important. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's actually true because I, I I've noticed. I mean, this is gonna sound kind of bad, so whoever is watching, I hope they forgive me. I noticed <laughs> the difference <laughs> in the original Sailor Moon, the deep version. All the emotion that the characters have, like like there were, there were some episodes where there was an episode where Serena and Darian broke up, and you could just feel her emotion more than one with her. <laughs> and then you watch the new versions, you go. Why they can't you do what Deep did? Whoever was those directors, they put the emotion in. Mm. It's like it's like over here, they're just reading the script, like na 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 blah, blah, blah. and you're like, no, there is a big difference. I noticed it's putting the emotion in your, your lines. Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting way to look at it. But if I told you, really, if I, uh, it's interesting because when I when I do cons. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm mo one of my panels is, you know, ask the voice director of Sailor Moon the stuff you won't learn about on Google, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all the stuff behind the scenes. And I talk about how it was put together and how we had no idea what we were doing. We yeah. really didn't. And so the fact that it was, the emotion, you, you'll also find that further to what you're saying, but it sounded more emotional, is it was a broader read in every respect. It was... Mm -hmm less sort of uh, group conversational and more individual because again, we never, it was all in bits and pieces. We would come in and okay, four lines from line from, from show 20, episode 22 and uh, uh, eight pages from, uh, from episode 28. And it was like, you would do little bits and pieces. We never knew what we were doing as a performer. We'd come in and be like, what are we doing today? I got a little bit of an advance when I directed, but, mm -hmm. Very, very little. And so uh, there would be, uh, well, I'm not even going to go into how it was, how it was dubbed. The dubbing procedure has changed dramatically. Yeah. It was, a, it was called rhythm band. And um, that's a, that's a whole top, different topic. But the words came by on a screen. It was not what we call a karaoke machine now where the lights come on and you read your line and you try to match the lips. Um, 
because I think the new one was not, they're not matching the lips. It was original voice. Performers read it, then they animate to it, which is kind of standard um, prelay animation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were trying to match, and, and the, the, so the rhythm, the rhythm band was all handwritten as well. Okay. <laughs> Dark ages, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, wait till you know how they got it in by pure, got the videos in via purolator. It was lovely. It wasn't even videos. It was cello tape about that wide. Uh, and um, there would be like, ah, like, and, and the performer would go, ah, as it came up because they had no rehearsal, right? And it'd be like, no, it's, ah, yeah. no indication necessarily, right? Because there was no direction on it, and you had to have had the script to know the context. Mm -hmm. Nobody got the script, so uh, it, it was interesting. So the fact that you're saying it was more emotional, it's probably because everything was just very heightened. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that came through, but you know, the new one is very smooth. I mean, it's a part of the. And again, when I when I'm when I'm doing that that particular panel, um, and they'll say, "Oh, which one do you like more?" Blah blah blah. And I said, "You know what? The original is very smooth. It's got, or rather, the uh, the the new version is very smooth and very, you know, everything's it's perfect. It's perfectly mm -hmm. done. The old one is organic. It's 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 got rough edges. It's got stuff that that should never have gotten in." Uh, really, really bad lip sync on some of the stuff. We'd have to sit and write dialogue sometimes. You know, like, I'm going to the store. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <Right? laughs> so, uh, you know, they're, they, they both have their, they both have their charm. Mm -hmm. But they're two, it's very much two different shows in so many ways. That's true. That's true. But I still like the original one. I, yeah. I guess it was also the music. The music was just like <clears throat> that they that they made for it. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit. I I enjoy both, but you know, yeah, the, the original because you woke up at five thirty in the morning, like, oh my gosh, it's on, and yeah. that's the first song before school started. So you were happy. Well, that's another thing. They didn't know when we were doing it. Mm -hmm. They had no idea when to run it. They thought, oh, is this adult? Is it for kids? It was. Because it had, you know, you got 15-year-old girls in, in miniskirts. It's like the, the TV gods were like, what the hell do we do with this? Right? Because <laughs> it seemed to appeal to kids. Yeah. But it had a sort of that adult, like, you know, you wonder, who's really watching this? <laughs> right? right? Yeah, you're, you're right. You know, you know, and so they didn't know where to run it. It ran in the morning, then it would run at 4 o'clock, and, and then it would run in the evening, and it was all over the place. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't figure out when to put it on. Yeah, the thing is also in that timeline, anime was new because mm -hmm. you know, Z that was very violent. And yeah. yeah, there were a lot of a lot of animes were being dubbed, and they didn't know what to do with it. They go, "What is this?" Well, I think that, I think Sailor Moon is actually I think Astro Boy was first. Yeah, uh, and then Sailor Moon came along, so mm -hmm. they were still going, "What is this?" You know, uh, <laughs> you're right. It's uh, it was a it was a phenomenon. That, uh, that, I mean, it took how long did it take before it really caught on? How long have cons, the anime cons, been going? You had to, you have to have before they could do that. You had to have had a volume of them, mm -hmm. right? There were no conventions for, you know, Care Bears, really. You know, <laughs> honestly, you know. I don't even know if I would. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> even I wouldn't go. <laughs> I just know, <laughs> you know. So the you know anime uh, the, it became its own genre mm -hmm. because there was a, a large volume, and it you know it's now probably more anime produced than animation, right? But mm -hmm. it's interesting because a lot of animation people don't know about anime, and a lot of anime people don't know about animation. They're they're very different worlds, mm -hmm. in so many ways. Not well, sure. now comes for the other question: sub or dub? Sorry, what? Which would you prefer, sub or dub? Sub or dub? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, can you clarify what that is before you say it? Me? Great. Yeah. Yeah. He's got to enter, you know. 
Well, dub, I know what dubbing is. What is I know what dub is. Oh, subtitles. Okay. So, uh, the subtitles are dubbing. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it depends. You know, if I'm watching an Italian movie, I don't know. I don't speak Italian. And it's always like, it. sometimes the characters don't match. Mm -hmm. the, the voices don't match the character. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know. I don't, actually, I just, you know, I, I didn't like either. I like to watch movies that are done in English. It's <laughs> much more comfortable. The whole idea of watching a movie is to relax. If I have to work at it, I don't think I want it. The is there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I'm watching something and the lips aren't matching. I know, I know. Out, I know. I, it drives yeah. me crazy. Like, even if oh. my player's like a half second off or something, I, I know. start it over. It's, it's very, it. it's tough, too. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's own uh, you know, it's its own sort of dimension too. It's its own discipline, if you will, right? Yeah. Because I've dubbed, I've, and I have dubbed. Uh, dubbing live action is even tougher because you can't. You can get away with a little bit in, in animation, right? Uh, be, because there are only a certain number of things. But if, in when we really speak, our lips move even more. Mm -hmm. in, in, <laughs> right. <laughs> And then, then a cartoon. I dubbed a. a did you ever see the, the movie Scanners? Mm -mm. Okay. I well, good because I I dubbed Scanners too. You would hear, even know less about that one. If it's good or not good. <laughs> well, well, the, the lead act, the, the the detective had a French Canadian accent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it was, and you know that a f foreign language requires. I mean, facially. You can sometimes tell what somebody's speaking by what well, I mean. I can. I mean a little bit. I guess because I'm I'm voice oriented, but the French Canadians have a big. There are a lot of sort of facial and lip movement when they when they're speaking French, but the French Canadian version of French. It's mm -hmm. like a, it's a bit of patois, if you will, and it, that was a, a real real tough job because they elongate certain things. And it's really difficult when you're speaking North American, like mid-Atlantic English to elongate those vowels when it's not part of the, the language, you know, it's not part of mm -hmm. our language, if you will. So in answer to Sabra Dub, neither for me. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't mind subtitles once in a while, but yeah, not but it, takes my, it takes me away from what the uh, the actors are looking. You're looking down to read the line, and you look up, and there's an expression that goes with it with a good performance on camera. That's that's why it's on camera. There's a the visual and the vocal, mm -hmm. right? So you, mm -hmm. you miss some of that. I will admit that we watch a lot of closed captions because a lot of times I can't understand some of the accents, right. Or they have those loud, soft movies where mm. it's like super loud, so you got to turn it down, and then they go soft on you. Right. All right. So, yeah. But that's not the same thing as an actual subtitle. That might drive me a little nuts. Yeah. Well, it was the hardest thing for me to watch Hidden Tiger, Crouching Dragon. Oh. I mean, it's such a good movie, but you had to read everything. Yeah. You couldn't really watch the movie. Yeah. You watch it twice, that's all. <laughs> And then hope you hope you know what's coming. Yeah. <laughs> now you can memorize the whole thing and go from there. Okay, I see. I uh, is that, is that your uh, your little temple back there? Uh, part of it. Okay. Part wow. of it. Holy moly! Oh, hold on. This cutie wanting to say hi. There he is. Hi, Greasy. Hi, this is Greasy. Hi. Um, I speak a better cat. So meow. <laughs> <laughs> We're good now. <laughs> if you speak cat, I need you to come over here and talk to ours. Yeah, you can, yeah I, got, I got one here that to deal with. I, I got a guy and a cat with a thyroid issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so ours, ours is like a monster. He's a Maine Coon Thanks mix. Oh. And then we have a dog that's like scrappy do on crack. So <laughs> it's, it's a fun mixture. We have oh, yeah. Samson is like Jeff Dunham, the comedian with the um, ventriloquism. His okay. one mannequin, Walter, is like mm -hmm. a first old man. That's Samson. 
And then Delilah, he has this other one called Peanut, who's like off the wall craziness. That's Delilah. Mm. So we have them both in the same house. So it's very entertaining. <laughs> it gets fun. Okay, Samson, long haired, I assume. No. Okay, well, uh, there you go. Thanks, part. He's already, then he's already met Delilah. Okay, good. <laughs> Comes with her own scissors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But the funny thing is we have concrete floors. So you know what Scooby-Doo when their feet are moving and they're not? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. All the time if she gets all excited, she's like running, running, running. Eventually she catches it and takes off. But it will be good to have, you know, if you uh, sort of, if there's a, a, a climate crisis and there's no electricity, uh, you, you know, replace the hamster, you know, and uh, there you go. You're going to get, you know, all that extra power. Exactly. With those, those back legs going, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Oh, Works I don't want to. I don't want to see any more days like that. <laughs> we don't need another freeze down here. Oh God, I remember. Yeah, my my wife's uh, girlfriend lives in uh, the woodlands, mm -hmm. and um, she's a, actually a real estate agent in the woodlands. And uh, she, uh, she, we heard the whole story firsthand. I mean, of course, we it was news mm -hmm. up here too. But wow, mm -hmm. that was. Pretty scary. Well, I was saying that 2020, before heading into that 2021 disaster, was like each month was a new level of Jumanji. Mm -hmm. And so when you reach Snowmageddon, that was like the finale. If you can survive this, then you've achieved it and you've won. So that's, yeah, that's what it was like. Yeah. Like we never had scary, scary, very, very scary. There's we had electricity maybe 25% for an entire week of the time. Maybe. I don't even think that. And then our water was gone from Wednesday to Monday. So I love generators. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you have to go get the gas and you couldn't get out of our thing because the roads were coming yeah. the ice and we're back roads. So there was no getting out. You had to have chains, four wheels, four wheel drive to get out, which we have. But still. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't pretty. No, I got I got lucky because I I've lived in New York for a year and I lived in Virginia for a few years, so I was used to like walking on ice and snow. Mm -hmm. So I had to teach my parents, and they were like, "How can you do this?" I go, "I already have experience. It's all about the way you move." <laughs> it is move slow, and we have a buck stove, so we're able to keep the heat and cooking because we didn't have electricity. So we did like the hobo meal thing, so that was fun. Yeah, we had we had gas stove, so I was like, yeah, that wasn't our favorite too. Mm -hmm. Only thing I couldn't use was the oven. It was the oven? Oh, okay. Yep. The oven would kill the generator. Everything else was attached to that generator. Got it. Propane tank attached right to the generator. Everything's <laughs> good. And we're not talking one of those little. No, we're talking. <laughs> yeah. 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 I yeah. bet the sales went up uh, appreciably after that, just in case it ever happened again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We're prepared. And then before that, we had Hurricane Harvey. So we so had during that hurricanes. It's you don't have one. You're living down here. You're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, we don't get hurricanes up here. Mm -hmm. We don't. We've had uh, you know high winds and take down some trees and knock over the deck chairs. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, other than that, <laughs> nothing. But we do get bitching cold winters. I was going to say, you probably get some nasty snow. So I'm looking at it now. Not <laughs> no, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, no. 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 <clears throat> it's fun to but, play in. I've been in it. It's like so fun. Just make it snow. Yeah, it's fun. That's right. Yeah, I was born in Minnesota my first seven years. So, yeah, I know snow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Born and raised in Houston. Oh, okay. Moved to Virginia for two years. First year I was there, it snowed three feet. Second year, it snowed four feet. Third year, I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I'm just not a fan. I just, I just, no, I mean, Greg and I talked about this before. Uh, my, my mother told me that I was four years old and I came in and said, Mommy, I hate the cold and snow. Right. <laughs> And as I said, I said, if you're four and you hate it, there's no way to go but down in terms of, <laughs> you know, dealing with winter. 
Exactly. That's never gotten any better. Well, I remember mm. one year in literally hours, it got up above my waist in That's snow. And I had to actually shovel to get into the house above my waist. And I'm five foot 11. So. Dang, I'd be gone. I'm four, I'm four 11. Yeah, you would be buried. Sorry. <laughs> Our daughter's four eight. She would have been gone. So. <laughs> <laughs> like fiddling through the snow, you know. Maybe I'm here. <laughs> where are you? Yeah. <laughs> up so I can see where we're at. Yeah. Right. Really just have right. been uh, they have like these poles for the um, snow plows. I said, if you have to live, <laughs> there's Casey. <laughs> Sorry, that's our daughter. I said, if you have to live somewhere where they have poles to indicate where the street is, I said, you need to move. Yeah. Because that's too high. And these poles were not short. They were like four to five feet. So mm -hmm. I'm like, mm, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> nope. Of course, Casey, Casey and Lizzie walking through the snow, walking into these poles. I can see that I happening now. <laughs> I'll just send Casey with Lizzie and we'll just we'll hear y'all yelling somewhere. <laughs> Hold on, little girl. I got you. Wait, wait, you're, you're talking on your back. <laughs> I was gonna say you guys aren't too much off. <laughs> oh lordy. But before I freeze to death now, thank you guys. <laughs> Thought yesterday was bad. I had absolutely nothing to do. I was my brain was just being driven crazy. It's like, I got to have something to do. <laughs> Casey says that's so wrong. <laughs> but, but I do want to thank everybody for coming on today. Mm -hmm. It was great seeing everybody. And John, thank you for coming on our show. And You're very welcome. We definitely will definitely have to catch up sometime and yes. talk a lot more, especially mm -hmm. with some of these panels that you have. I, I'm picturing them for some conventions. For real. But you were right. definitely great. Thank you for coming on. And thank you for having me, all of you. Thanks for the prompts, the uh, interesting conversation, and uh, the chance to vent a little bit. And uh, oh yes, and reminisce about and me. reminisce. I love reminiscing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and what they say, nostalgia is not what it used to be. Exactly. So no. if we don't see you guys on Tuesday, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Yes, and everybody, we will be on Tuesday at eleven a.m. Yep. And until then, adios.